So we'll, so let's just get started. My name is Jeremy Eder. I'm joined today uh, with Derek Carr from the OpenShift engineering team. You are in a session called Five New High Performance Features in OpenShift. If you're in the wrong room, there you go. So uh, I'll let Derek introduce himself in a minute, just really quick. Um, this is my eighth summit, so I really appreciate all the audience members that have come, uh, and my actually my eighth consecutive presenting. So thank you for coming again. Working the Red Hat Performance and Scale Engineering team, and we have several projects underway. One of them we're gonna focus on today, which is bringing high performance features to OpenShift. And so that's my role, is advocating for customers. The shirt will make sense soon, I promise. This is not out of my standard wardrobe. You wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, so I suggested that Jeremy wear the Snowflake shirt, and hopefully we'll find out soon. So I'm, I'm Derek Carr, I'm a technical group lead on the OpenShift uh, product engineering team. I largely oversee many of our individual development teams from the container runtime all the way up through our engagement in the Kubernetes upstream. Folks may have seen me in the Kubernetes project. Uh, I am a steering committee member, I co-chair SIGnode, and I also co-lead uh, a resource management working group that uh, has been driving many of the features that you'll hear about today. Okay, so a short story. Let's rewind the clock to sometime in 2016. OpenShift 3.0 has GA'd. From a performance engineer standpoint, I'm wondering why anybody, ha why we haven't heard yet uh, about why I can't run a certain workload on OpenShift, a Snowflake <laughs> workload, if you will. Who thinks they have Snowflake workloads right now? No? Just a handful? So there are some customers with two hands from one gentleman. Excellent. So I, I felt like I was gonna be in some, some company. Let's describe, so anyway, the Snowflake workload in, in, in summary is something that requires some tuning, maybe some extra TLC to run well. It's highly regarded in the business part of the company as the, the critical application that, um, that must, be, you know, must be tuned and, and operating at all times. So I wanna run, I wanna think about running this thing on OpenShift, again, this is in 2016. All of the customers that I deal with on a daily basis, so I'm, I'm heavily biased and skewed, are ones who are running high performance workloads. That's CRM applications, ERP, gigantic in-memory databases, financial services, uh, financial trading applications, telecom applications, and whatnot. I wanna run these things on OpenShift, can yep. you help? I'd love to help you, Jeremy. You know, Jeremy actually walked by my desk about a year and a half ago and was representing these folks saying, you know, I, I want to run on OpenShift, and I said, that's a great idea, Jeremy, but, you know, what's stopping you? Well, my workload is the most special of all workloads. It's so important, in fact, that I'm not willing to trust it to just anybody. Can you help? I mean, I'd love to. I mean, you are special. Your workload is special. You know, what's the problem? The problem is the slide clicker is not advancing. <laughs> So, we'll just have to pull an audible now. How about the arrow key? My application is latency sensitive. Network latency sensitive or CPU latency sensitive. It's so important that we not drop any packets, that we not build up a queue. Things must be serviced in a deterministic in a deterministic way. Otherwise, the business people are gonna haul ass down the hallway, stop at my cube, and then their hail will go on fire. Okay. Can we avoid that? I think we can. Uh, is this like a blocker to actually running on an orchestration platform today? I think so right now. Okay. I, w I certainly wouldn't trust it to happen just yet. All right. All right. So it also, by the way, and I forgot this slide was in there, it's got a gigantic in-memory cache. Of course. Yeah, gigantic. Of course. Um, it also requires some tuning on the host, if anyone has ever played. Who's heard of TuneD before? TuneD, awesome. It's a service that's on by default in RHEL 7, provides node level tuning for, uh, tuned for certain application workloads. Our group is responsible for the content of those profiles. My Snowflake application runs the TuneD profile uh, called Snowflake. Of course it does. Um, let's keep going. This is getting interesting. Yeah, so this application not only is CPU and latency sensitive, but normal CPUs can't even handle it. So we've got hardware accelerators that our team has developed. Those are our value add. That's how we win in competitive, um, against our competitors. So I can't bring this application and then not run it with an accelerator of some kind. I have to have my cake and I also have to eat it too. All right. Can you help me? 
I'd love to help you. It might take some time. <sighs> I'm not good with waiting. Okay. I'm awful with waiting. Okay. It's a snowflake. I've heard. Yeah. And now, in do you fact, just have one of these workloads? No. No. A lot of them. No. You All wish. Right. You wish. There's a lot of them running around. So um, is it a beast to manage and operationalize? Yeah, it's horrible. Okay. It's horrible. Several dev several SREs have lost their lives in service to this application. Okay. All right. Yeah. Several. I, I hope SREs. to not lose mine, but let's see what we can do for you. I was going to say several SREs have lost their weekends <laughs> to this application. All right. So about a year and a half ago, Jeremy came by, and uh, we've had that frank discussion. I, I was like, "Well, there's there's work we got to do in the container space and the orchestration space, but you know, let's let's not give up." Um, and so. For folks who've been tracking the Kubernetes project generally and the OpenShift product, uh, you build a container runtime, you build an orchestrator, and one of the first things you want to do before even Jeremy talked about it was get it reliable. Like, make the actual environment that's running your workload on the node reliable so that you can start thinking about folks like him who want to do deep performance tuning. So um, about a year and a half ago, a lot of us in the community felt like um, around the Kubernetes 1.6 and OpenShift 3.6 release, we had gotten a lot of the core primitives we want on the node to start transitioning around uh, how can we support more broad workloads in depth. Uh, so across the upstream community with SIG nodes, SIG scheduling, and then as I talked about earlier, the resource management work group we formed, we started to putting an eye towards how do we expand the set of workloads we can support so that folks like Jeremy can, can save their snowflake SREs workloads. lives. Yeah. Well, they're not even snowflake, they're typical these days, right? So, mm. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you don't lose anything with respect to reliability of the cluster and also that the and user experience you see to consume these primitives are kept simple so their developers don't have to think too hard. And with these goals in mind, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the last year. I like the idea of keeping it simple. It's important. Because right now it's intense. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know how much longer we can survive this way because the business is asking for more, more, more. Yeah. And we need, we need a more efficient platform to run on. Yeah. So this is an interesting point and for folks in the room who might think about these things. A lot of the topics that you'll hear about I personally wrote four or five different design proposals for how to achieve that I will say went from deep complexity to simplicity and hopefully we landed in a neat middle spot, but uh, it was very important to keep it simple. At some point this will work. Okay, uh, so I mentioned earlier that our team works with a variety of, of customers in a variety of verticals. This is the extent of my design experience, and this is what I'm capable of from a design, graphic design standpoint, so I apologize. But I hope the idea comes across that there's some overlap between these workloads. We ended up in 2015 visiting many customers and identifying what features they wanted to, uh, were blocking them from onboarding into a containerized world. Out of that came this idea that things were largely over, there was a lot of overlap more than we ever expected. Uh, customers were really, and by the way, I love talking to customers, so hit, like, right after we leave here, I would love to just sync up with anyone who thinks they have Snowflake workloads. We can sort out how to get your workload onto OpenShift. But we wanted to talk, so the upstream community doesn't want to build like bespoke features for one, for one vertical, and I agree with them, it doesn't make sense. Um, so we have been, and Derek has been leading this, have been trying to find a way to plumb these things uh, generically and allow for, for some flexibility. So up on the right is just a sense of some of the verticals that we've been in touch with and that are driving these, um, that are driving these features. More in depth, some of the overlap that we did find is things like CPU pinning, node level tuning like syscontrols, huge pages were there because People needed, uh, we're running like large JVMs or large C applications that show up a lot in financial services. Um, they definitely hated the idea of an overlay network. Uh, so, it, you know, and this is kind of like, it depends on your workload for sure, it always depends. But certain people needed a separate data plane uh, network. In addition to that, kernel module loading came up quite a bit for supporting. Um, exotic hardware, I would say. And of course, always, always NUMA comes up. So we'll talk through, Derek will talk through some of the roadmap uh, as well as where we're at right now. Yep, so Jeremy did a lot of great investigative work. We've took this forward to the community and we tried to get a roadmap in place for like what we wanted to tackle first and what were the priority orders we had to, to achieve. And then as a group, uh, we kind of focused on these five surface areas we'll hear about today. Um, and I'm, I think for, Literally every feature we'll talk about, 
it's at least available in a tech preview fashion, if not fully GA now in OpenShift. Um, and we're looking to close that as soon as possible. And so, um, uh, generally speaking, I think we've expanded a lot of the food groups of, of types of things that Snowflake apps would need, so. So we have a couple of demos. Um, in fact, we have five demos. Yeah. First one, Derek, I think you're up here. Um, yeah, so before you talk about like resource management and how to run your app well, generally it's important to just make sure we all have a level set understanding about what uh, cluster orchestrators uh, support today in the OpenShift product. Um, a lot of people who are onboarding workloads onto OpenShift are coming from like a traditional VM environment where they had access to all these things. And then when you look to move this onto a shared cluster, you need to make that thing schedulable. You need to make that thing actually isolated with other containers that might be on the machine. And at this point, I think we've made a lot of progress uh, with respect to the, the concepts that uh, the OpenShift scheduler and the node isolation capabilities we have today can support. So basic CPU, memory, uh, ephemeral storage. So that would be like your copy on write layer usage in the container, um, persistent storage, Folks are familiar with like persistent volume planes and persistent volumes might be thinking about those things. And then some of the more uh, specialized things like huge pages or device plugins, which we'll go into more depth on. And then things we don't even know about that we think people want to be able to schedule, we'll talk about extended resources. Like a dongle? Like a dongle, okay. a license, a number okay. of things. Got it. Um, and in some cases, you know, what you might see in the user-facing eye, a few user-facing API may look uh, like slightly simplistic. But in the background, we've uh, expose what we feel like are the beginnings of some tuning knobs for how you want to tune individual components that say this is how you know, this node manifests that CPU request or enforces that CPU limit, um, which uh, uh, is allowing some innovation in the community as we you know, arrive on the best possible solution for the broadest set of apps. So just before we go on, I forgot to ask. Um, some of these things are Kubernetes specific terms, but are any of these features in use in your environments today? Raise your hand if you've used one or more of these features. Yep. Okay, 30% maybe. Thanks. Uh, so generally when we talk about resource management, you know, it's, it's, we're probably gonna focus a lot of today's discussion on like compute resource management. And so who's, who's written a pod spec today? Like, okay. So traditionally you have a pod spec, that pod has a set of containers. Each one of those containers says, I request this much CPU or memory. I'm limited by this much CPU and memory. The ratio between your request and your limit is what we call your level of overcommit. Now, the request is what the cluster scheduler is going to guarantee that you actually get, and the limit is what you might be able to achieve if there's no other noise on the node. Um, and we use, if you want to go to the next slide, we use that concept between a request and a limit to uh, identify this concept of a quality of service, or SLO, in the project. And there's really three quality of service dimensions that we're talking through. Uh, there's the best effort quality of service, which is no effort, and so I would not recommend folks spending a lot of time on that, but a lot of people who, who make mistakes when getting their workload on top of OpenShift, like, kind of imagine that the platform is auto-sizing everything for them, but in some degree, you have to make that minimum request, and you don't get avoid, you don't get out of that problem space. So if I, don't, if I don't have any requests or limits on my pod? So if you have no requests and limits, you can try to consume as much as the node will give you, and, you know, there's some buyer beware arguments around that, so we've, when I talked about node reliability in France, as we did, uh, if you start to cause havoc on the node, I might kick your workload off, Jeremy. So that's probably not the place you want to land. No, not and good. So the sweet spot for many classes of workloads is in the burstable quality of service tier or the, the guaranteed quality of service. Um, and so the burstable is typically those people who want some minimal level of CPU or, or memory guarantees, uh, but are okay living on the edge slightly uh, and, and wanting to take advantage of, of local resources that are available. And the guaranteed workload uh, classes, those people who are, are very determined on, I want to have, uh, this is my request, I don't care about burst, I want reliable performance. And as a project and a product here in OpenShift, we're looking to provide differentiation along those tiers. So people who are latency sensitive or want uh, better SLA requirements, that as you move up that quality of service stack, uh, we will ensure to make sure that you get the best performance as your application runs. So, so far it sounds to me like the guaranteed tier is the Snowflake tier. Uh, it's one of the Snowflakes tier, or it's like a business critical tier. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, how many people have deployed an OpenShift cluster today? Tomorrow, yesterday, planning on it. Okay. Today isn't in a lab today? That's awesome. 
So, you know, this is a, a traditional view of what the cluster topology looks like. You have your control plane nodes, your infra nodes, and your general compute nodes. Um, and one of the things we we're looking to try to do is kind of differentiate the types of compute nodes you can support. So you might have some CPU bound workloads, you might have some memory bound workloads, you might have some machine learning workloads, and often you want to steer those workloads to those nodes that can satisfy that workload type. And so today, uh, you know, that's, that's Jeremy Snowflakes at this point. Um, if we look at where we're going, if you want to go to the next slide, um, folks who are tracking the origin project, which is uh, in flight now, and what you'll see in the next release of OpenShift and our 3.10 release, you'll see some behavioral changes about how you configure nodes. So how many people have looked at a node config YAML file? Okay, great. So like today, you know, you, you set some variables in Ansible, you, you, you run your, your playbook, and the node config gets sent out to every machine in your cluster. Um, that's being inverted in 3.10. Um, where all of your node configuration is stored in the API server itself as config maps. So if you install OpenShift 3.10, uh, when you get that out of the gate, you'll see a new project or a new namespace called OpenShift node. And that is what actually holds your node config. And when, when nodes uh, come alive on your cluster, they're given a bootstrap configuration that says, hey, API server, this is who I am. And then the API server hands you down your proper config. And so that might include how you've tuned your kubelet, you know, what, uh, what your system reservation should be, what your, your, your uh, basically the model by which you wanna bound that kubelet and how it runs is now delivered from the API server down rather than you pushing it out to every node. I think this is a really important enhancement to make node management easier, because uh, there's a lot of benefits to this. So one of the things as we talk through the discussion is like default kubelet arguments is nice to hand down from the API server. It's easy to change just that config map. And when you change that config map, there's actually a daemon set pod that'll be running on lo every local node that says, ah, oh, I see my config has changed. Let me push it down to the local machine and restart the kubelet. And now your kubelet is running in a new way. Uh, but there's some other nice things. A lot of people have complained that it's hard to label their nodes or manage their node labels, as well as any default taints if you want to direct workloads to particular machines. All of that now can be easily centralized and managed just like any other config map resource on the API server. Um, so moving on. The first feature we're gonna talk about here, I'll actually in the demonstrations show how some of that works. Um, so today, Jeremy, what, what's your challenges with CPU? Well, first of all, I need to make sure that I'm not getting descheduled. I yes. have to have dejittered cores and I have to always run. Okay. Um, so. How many people today, if I was to ask, like, if you, if you write a pod spec that says, I want one core, really knows what that means? Okay. How many people think that it means they get an exclusive core? Like, right, okay. You, you don't. And today, like CPU today in the cluster, it's not really normalized based on clock speed or anything. Like, if, if, it's, if it's a core, uh, we don't care about the speed, it just shows up as one core. But at the, at the end of the day, you're depending on some lower level uh, Linux primitives in the, in the CFS scheduler to enforce things but it's not your dedicated CPU. And so that's actually probably a challenge for Jeremy and his class of workloads. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, today, when you ask for one core, you ask for half a core or 100 millicores or no cores at all, we're really just setting some knobs in the container runtime that says, this is the number of CFS shares you get. And if you had a limit, uh, that we're setting like your CFS quota value. Um, and generally speaking, for many classes of workloads, that works great, so CFS shares, are only enforced if there's no other contention on the nodes. So when, you, when uh, not a lot is happening on that CPU, you get all the CPU. But when things start happening, suddenly your CPU performance can go way down, right? So reliable performance is probably a problem for you, right? Indeed. It, 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 yeah. Well, luckily, like, so we have enough gear so yep. that we're trying not to overcommit for those reasons, so. Yep. So one way we try to improve reliable performance is you start setting limits. And the problem when you set limits is nobody likes to be throttled. Um, and so uh, there's kind of like the sweet spot that we're trying to find right now, which is, you know, if you want half a core and we limit you to half a core, how do we give you the best experience to get that half a core? Um, and right now I'd say like when Jeremy came to me 18 months ago, um, I, I don't know if we were giving the best experience or the most normalized experience because people, their CPU time is distributed across all cores. So if you have a 40 core box and you ask for one core, you might be getting context switched, right? And if you're setting limits, a lot of people get upset about throttling. 
So generally speaking, your, your important workload for CPU bound, what, we tried to do a lot to help you. And yeah, it was next. not working when we first tried it. Yeah, it so we tried to make this easier without making the end user change. So if you look at the next slide, a new feature you'll see uh, in OpenShift uh, and uh, is the ability to support multiple CPU management policies. So one of the Kubelet arguments uh, you'll see tweaked in the demo is saying uh, you can control how the Kubelet uh, enforces CPU and the default policy is the normal policy you've seen today where your CPU time might be shared across all cores, you could be context switched. But for Jeremy's specialized class of application where CPU latency is important and consistent performance is important, we have a new policy called the static policy. And if I was asked a question, Jeremy, are you happy if you move across cores over the life of your workload? Uh, largely, we are not happy. Yeah. That happens. And, and what's the problem you run into there? So, it, well, blows away all the cache that we're, we already, all yeah. our hot cache lines are now dumped. Yep. And we have to reload all that stuff. Yep. And while we're doing that, our application slows down yep. and the user perceptible performance changes. That's what's the problem. And you're using GPUs too, right? Yeah, for sure. So in the long run, you want your CPU close to your GPU. Of course. Right. You can't, you can't have it any other way. Yeah. So right now, like as the arc of the Kubernetes project goes, we want to be able to get the Kubelet really intelligent about how to schedule these resources, especially when they're codependent. Now, right now, we've done some work to make it that the Kubelet will, when you ask for one core and you land on a box that says, I'm using static CPU pinning, the Kubelet's going to assign you a core and guarantee you that for the life of your workload, you will never move off that core and no one else can run on it. So you should get improved, consistent performance. This isn't necessarily the end-all, be-all policy that you can land on, and not everyone necessarily should run this way. And we expect to innovate around other policies in the future, but uh, it definitely improves Jeremy's... Uh, yeah, so one of the things, that was, so one of the workloads we, we tested this with is the OpenShift router, which is a packet processing HA proxy thing, right? Um, sensitive to jitter, sensitive to sched kernel scheduling. That was an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, and the boost there, it depends on a lot of factors, but the boost there was in double digits for sure, and sometimes up to nearly 30%. Um, if we had a really pathological scenario. So these are useful innovations for the platform itself, not just applications that run on top of OpenShift. Yeah. So if we want to switch to a demo, you can see sure. this in action. Um, I'm hoping this will be readable, and if not, we can talk through it. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm running a 3.10 uh, early release of OpenShift, um, and the first thing you'll see is uh, there's a new set of config maps in the OpenShift node namespace, and I'm going to tweak the node config node namespace, which is basically your general purpose compute node type. And you know, if we look at this here, you scroll down, this is a typical node config file you would have seen. And there's a section in here around Kubelet arguments, and I'm just going to change the CPU manager policy to static. And hopefully that didn't go too quick, but it probably did. Um, I've changed it to static, and so every node that's now running with that policy is going to enforce CPU differently. And so the first thing you'll see here is there's a workload that's running, uh, and these are two core boxes, and it's landed on a machine that has the normal traditional policy, and oh, I forget when I did this demo how it worked out, but what you'll see when I actually exec into the pod, you'll see that uh, if you look at the CPU set policy, you'll see that that's allowed to work on core zero through two, or zero through one, because it's a two core box. And then I switch to another workload here, which is just a PHP app, and it's running on a node that has the static CPU pinning policy. Uh, you'll see it's in the guaranteed quality of service tier, and this ran on a different machine that had the new policy in place, and when I ask, hey, Pod, what CPUs are you running on, you'll see it's restricted to just the zero CPU core ID. So that pod is CPU bound, or is bound to that particular CPU for the life of the pod. There's a lot of nuance and intelligence in the Kubelet about how it chooses which CPU you get, how it handles hyperthreads, uh, but from an end user experience, I didn't have to change, like the end user, I said I want one core, I want a half a core. It's more like a tuning experience now where you can say I want to run on a different node type that gives me a different enforcement of CPU. There's some downsides when you run this way, like you get, maybe you get worse density because you have a workload that's taking in a whole CPU core, but there are performance benefits with respect to normalizing your behavior, so. Cool. Okay, so back to the slides then. <clears throat> you know the demo goes real quick, but the loading goes real slow. Uh, they're not using <laughs> they're not using exclusive cores. Yeah. So, all right. So the next feature we'll talk about is is huge pages. Um, how many people know what huge pages are? Okay, cool. So like traditionally, this has been a hard thing to manage, um, 
And so th this is now a, a GA feature in OpenShift. Uh, and um, if you are a, an application that's running with a large memory working set, you know, you're a large cache, you're a large JVM, you, there are some cases where people are sensitive to the TLB misses and want to have uh, large memory pages. Um, so for that class of application, there's now native support for uh, being able to manage huge pages like any other resource of multiple page sizes. So if you slip to the, skip to the next slide. Um, so Jeremy, your application, how do you, how do you consume huge pages? Uh, well, we use Shemget. You do? Yeah. Okay. So how many people are familiar with like huge TLBFS, uh, that type of stuff? All right, there's one brave guy in the front here. So there's two ways you can typically consume huge pages. Sometimes you, you want to consume it as like a, a volume. In, it'll be treated just like any other volume in your pod spec. And so you'll see on the bottom here, you can now have an empty dir volume who's backed by huge TLBFS by just saying my medium is huge pages. Um, and then if you're using shimget, uh, you make a huge page request like you do any other resource. And you'll see here there's a limit. And it says I want uh, 100 megs of 2 megabit huge pages. And at the end of the day, when that pod, that pod will get scheduled to a machine that only has that resource available, just like CPU or memory. It's exclusive to you for the life of the resource. We do not overcommit huge pages. And uh, you know, it's, it's available for you to use like anything else. So there's a quick demo here. Um, and some of the neat things about how, hopefully this doesn't go too quick. Um, what you'll see in this demo is a simple daemon set that just runs on every node I want to expose huge page workloads on. And it just uh, uh, runs, pre-allocates the huge pages on that node, kicks the kubelet, kubelet sees the huge pages are now present on that node, and then the scheduler can just very quickly schedule any workloads that require huge pages. So the actual management overhead of like pre-allocating huge pages across your cluster is like a two-line operation here. Uh, so in this case, in the demo, I've labeled one node says uh, I'm a huge pages node. Uh, in the limits section, you'll see there's currently no huge pages uh, expressed as a capacity. Uh, I'm going to deploy a daemon set, which you'll see is nothing more than a simple bash script uh, that just echoes uh, the number of huge pages I want into uh, to tell the, the kernel to pre-allocate them. And this is a slower demo. Okay, so you'll see a daemon set here. Like I said, it's just a simple uh, bash script that targets those nodes I said want to run huge page workloads. And all it does at the end of the day is echo into the right proc directory to get those huge pages allocated. Using standard uh, OpenShift primitives to deploy that daemon set, you'll see there's this huge page allocator daemon set that runs on that node I've targeted. Uh, it errors the first time. I, ran out of time. The second time, it worked great. It's now pre-allocated the huge pages. I describe that node, and you'll see that this node says, oh, I, I now have uh, a new number of huge pages available. And then just like CPU or memory or any other resource, ephemeral storage, Kubernetes is now intelligent enough to schedule it. And so any pod that might have been pending and needed that uh, resource to be scheduled can then just get placed to the right node, and, and life's great. Um, yeah, I don't know. We can see the final pod here. So here's a scheduling the pod. And uh, uh, pretty simple pod. Just a, I have a certain amount of CPU and memory requirement, and I needed two megs of huge pages. And these are all linked in the session afterwards. But I think folks get the idea. And uh, that huge page volume pod now lands and runs, and that application can now consume huge pages like anything else. So I think I think, Jeremy, I think we've made like huge pages kind of cloud native for you here, right? Cloud native huge pages? Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Oops. There seems to be one more step here. What were we missing? It's OK. All right. That's that. Who's using the Wi-Fi? <laughs> that's that's allowed. That's allowed. Okay, a couple more features. Quick time check. Um, we only have about fifteen minutes, so yeah, we're gonna have to put the hammer down now, uh, which is typical for my talks. Uh, okay, so 
extended resources. I, we, I talked earlier about the dongle that we have, the application whose license is controlled by a physical device that gets plugged into a USB port. People have seen these things before, maybe. Um, you can teach Kubernetes about anything. You can teach Kubernetes about dongles. On the right-hand side of this uh, chart, you'll see towards the bottom that I'm requesting example.com slash dongle. I'm requesting three dongles, okay? And a dongle just is any precious resource that you have, like a license, for example. Um, it ends up being an implementation detail for most use cases. In fact, you'll see in the next demo that the, the way that we've implemented GPUs actually leverages the extended resource uh, functionality. And I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader, but the user interface to this is actually just sending HTTP requests via curl. So it's about as bad as it gets. Um, it's really not intended to be used right now uh, by hand. So uh, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, so an extended resource is just a resource that Kubernetes can schedule, but it doesn't really isolate at the node level. So if you wanted to like, start isolating other extended resources, the major resource type that we wanted to tackle was devices. So how many people have workloads that use GPUs? At least a couple people. Okay, how many people think they might need GPU support in the future in their environment? Okay. So um, for Jeremy's uh, special workload, GPU enablement is uh, obviously, GPUs are everywhere, they're popular. Uh, people are doing real things with them, but they weren't really Kubernetes native. And uh, to facilitate GPUs as well as other device types for people who wanted to make their device available to the cluster, uh, we've been working for the past year on a concept called device plugins. The API is super small. You can see it entirely there. If you are an ISV vendor and you're interested in exposing your device in OpenShift, it's a small API for you to implement. And the basic flow of it that it works is you, devote, you deploy your device plugin as a daemon set on the cluster. It's just a pod, and it registers itself with the kubelet and says, hey, I know how to manage this device type that's on this machine. So if you're NVIDIA and you're running GPUs, the NVIDIA device plugin says, hey, I, I, I have discovered that there's you know, six GPUs on this machine, and hey, kubelet, I know how to manage them. The kubelet says, great, I'm gonna let you uh, manage GPUs. What does it mean to manage them? So like as a device vendor, you wanna know like if I'm doing cluster-wide computing, like can I monitor this thing? What happens if my GPU fails? Like I don't want the kubelet scheduling it. What if my workload is given a bad GPU? Like the major uh, capability here is that the kubelet then asks that device plugin, tell me if your device is healthy. Is it healthy? Is it healthy? Oh, it's not healthy anymore? I'll stop scheduling workloads to that device. And anybody who's on that uh, device today, I might uh, choose to evict them and say I can't provide you any guarantees anymore. Um, so with that, a lot of folks in the community have been interested in integrating uh, their devices with uh, OpenShift, and we'll talk about one concrete example. Yeah, okay, so one concrete example, here we go. Uh, so we've, we have a, a, a peer team at NVIDIA who are working with on Kubernetes GPU enablement. What I've got for you today are, are two demos. One shows you how to, uh, how to stand up a, a GPU pod, and the second one is consuming multiple GPU pods to do ImageNet. Um, image recognition. On the right-hand side, you've got a pod spec. You can see here under the resources side, uh, under the resources section, you've got nvidia.com slash GPU requesting one GPU. That is in itself an extended resource that was written by NVIDIA's device plugin. When the node, uh, sorry, when the, when the uh, node has a matching resource like that, it becomes a candidate for, for scheduling. On the bottom of the slide is a detail we don't have time to get into today where um, I've created logical partitions within the cluster uh, using something called taints and tolerations, which allows me to deflect all workloads except those who require a GPU from these nodes. So creating a, a logical partition, a node, a node pool. That's because typically people who buy GPUs really want GPU workloads only running on that node type, right? It's too expensive and too precious of a resource to share. Let's see how this one goes. Okay, so I've got an OpenShift 310 cluster. I've got a, uh, an instance on Amazon that has two NVIDIA GPUs in it, but OpenShift has no idea about them. In the capacity, there's nothing listed with NVIDIA there, right? Okay. Right now, NVIDIA has uh, an OCI hook, which Red Hat's distribution of Docker supports. The upstream Docker does not currently. 
uh, and, and Cryo also supports. What this hook does is, is bind mount some stuff into the container, uh, NVIDIA libraries into the container. We've got some SE Linux stuff at the bottom, and then we're gonna run a test container. This is just some simple Ansible stuff to make things easier for me to build this demo. So I'm just gonna deploy this runtime hook, and uh, that, it's a pre-start hook, so every time a container starts, it runs through this flow, and if it finds a, that there's a GPU requested for that pod based on some environment variables in the Docker file, it will then actually follow that, those code paths. So I've got the deployment, uh, sorry, I've got the, the hook installed, I'm now creating a, what's called the security context constraint, which is an OpenShift con or a Kubernetes construct for, uh, se for security. In this case, I'm blowing away all of the isolation that would normally occur on a, on a pod by default in OpenShift by allowing it to have access to the host, all the host namespaces. Uh, and what I've got here is the actual pod, uh, the actual pod spec for the, for the device plugin daemon set itself. So I'm going a little bit too fast for my, for my mouth here, but on the top you can see I've got uh, a node selector. So this, this pod, this daemon set, is only gonna run on nodes that have this label on them. I'll create the device plugin in a couple of, uh, the, the device plugin daemon set. Uh, Let's check if it's running. It's running on one node because there's only one node in this cluster that has the corresponding label. And that daemon set, Jeremy, is what has taught the kubelet about GPUs generally now, right? Yep. Yes. So in this, yeah, so we, here's, here's what Derek was just talking about. In the capacity of the node, now I have two GPUs listed. These are now schedulable objects from Kubernetes. A pod can now be started that requests a GPU and not just sit there forever in pending state which is what would happen if there were no GPUs available in the whole cluster. It would stay there in pending state until a GPU, until a GPU uh, became available. So I've got two GPUs of capacity on this, uh, on this Amazon node. And we'll create a test pod here uh, and then run device query inside it, which is just a, a CUDA thing, NVIDIA CUDA thing. My pod requests one GPU. It's got a toleration for that particular uh, taint. It will run only in my logical partition. It creates this pod, and if it ever gets into running state in a couple of seconds, uh, you will, will connect to the pod, like if in your earlier demo, uh, Derek, exec into this pod and, and check the CPU set for that, uh, for those, uh, for that C group. In this case here, I'm execing into the pod and running a uh, device query, which again, just a CUDA sample utility to prove that now I, this pod has access to, to GPUs. So that's the, that's the work we've been doing with the NVIDIA team, and if anybody had watched any of the KubeCon stuff. Uh-oh, watch out. <laughs> now let's just let this play. Uh, then then, then they'll, they'll take down our video. So YouTube is, is machine learning my, my uh, viewing habits. You guys can know. <laughs> I love heavy metal, okay. <laughs> so the next, the next demo um, is a little bit more polished. This is the Jupyter Notebook one that consumes multiple GPUs. Uh, if I could apply it to like what video would play next, you know, it might be a Metallica song. All right. So GPUs are a lot like exclusive CPUs. Like a GPU today is not shared across multiple workloads. So if you get a GPU, it's your GPU and, on, and only yours. Yeah, and one thing I should say is that this demo is running on loop down on the exhibit floor, so if you have questions, I'm there most of the day tomorrow to talk through um, anyone who's got Snowflake workloads. Happy to talk through this stuff with you guys. So OpenShift version 3.10, um, this works the same in 3.9 actually, uh, but I've got 3.10 here. I've got a node with two GPUs. Uh, it shows up in my capacity. I've deployed a cafe pod uh, that has a Jupyter uh, has, uh, sorry, a Jupyter Notebook in it. I've requested two GPUs towards the bottom of this uh, pod spec. I'll go ahead and create that pod, and I'll run OC Expose, which creates a route so I can access the website uh, that's running you know, the Jupyter website, okay? So this is included in CAFE, this demo. It's nothing special. What it's doing, faster than I can talk again, is running image an image processing uh, benchmark. And you can see here, what I just clicked was run this workload on one GPU, and these are old GPUs, so forget about these numbers, because NVIDIA on the newest hardware can do 1,000 per GPU these days. This is old stuff because we're cheap and wanted to run the cheapest Amazon nodes. <laughs> Nothing more than that. But, so anyway, you can process 58, 60 images a second, right? That's the only thing that's important. When we 
add a second GPU for the, the latter half of this demo, it speeds up. And just to prove out that functionally it is consuming two GPUs, it's running twice as fast as the original, um, which only consumed one GPU. So those are the demos uh, for GPUs. And I think I actually... I still think there's one thing missing, Jeremy, about your application that we can't yet support. So you were CPU sensitive, you had right. huge caches, you were computationally complex in your GPUs, but you still needed some host level tuning. So maybe uh, I think our last feature here was... That is true. We've found the magic incantation. Okay. My, we, our guys have the perfect syscontrol mix. Of course. Yep. Um, so how many people are familiar with syscontrols? Yeah, great. Um, Sys controls can be slightly difficult to manage in practice, uh, but they're kind of broken down into three different buckets. So um, when we look to support sys controls uh, natively in OpenShift, there's kind of multiple types. What we call safe, that would be a sys control that you can put in your pod spec and independent of how your host is configured, it's properly isolated and, and scoped to just that pod boundary. Then there's unsafe sys controls, which is a pod, if a pod was to consume it, it could impact other workloads on that machine. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. You should just use it safely and understand what other workloads might be on that machine that are impacted. Mm -hmm. um, Node-level stuff is where our bread and butter normally. Okay. okay. So, yeah, we need a solution for that. Yeah, and you're not alone. There's plenty of people that, that deal with that. And in that case, that, that's a snowflake node, and you have to use, uh, you have to be responsible about how you steer workloads to that node. But across that safe and unsafe boundary, uh, the way you configure your unsafe sys controls is there's a flag within your, your kubelet arguments that says these are, these are the sys controls that have been identified unsafe that I'm allowed to run if I see a pod that requests it. If a pod was to request an unsafe sys control and you hadn't uh, guarded the kubelet to reject it, uh, or hadn't enabled the kubelet to run it, the kubelet would just re refuse to run your workload and you know, you're safe by default. Um, so right now, sys controls is an is a alpha feature uh, in Kubernetes, as well as tech preview in OpenShift. It's been around for a very long time, so since 3.4, I believe. Um, and I'm aware of plenty of people using it in production even though they shouldn't be. Uh, so we're very motivated to actually now promote it up into beta. So this is work that Red Hat's uh, leading right now in the Kubernetes 1.11 release cycle to actually promote syscontrol out of annotations into first class fields on your pod spec. So if, and that'll folks, be awesome. Yeah, so I really would like your feedback on that proposal. I'm about to merge it hopefully next week, so uh, I want to get it right. Okay, so. let's merge it. Actually, we're, I think we're out of time to show this demo, honestly, because we have like one minute left. So let's just, let's just summarize here. Annotations are what's, what we currently have in alpha. I've selected one, and I promise you, when you run this container, the tuning inside the container will be different than on the host. That's it. So with your 30 seconds left, do you want to go through this? Yeah, so we've, we've done a lot in the last year to uh, make Kubernetes smarter and make Red Hat uh, OpenShift able to support more specialized workloads like Jeremy demanded uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, but we're not quite done. And so um, some of the major areas that we're starting to explore now are the interplay between these features you've seen. So you saw CPU scheduling uh, being aware on the kubelet. Uh, but then if you had consumed the GPU, we want to make sure that we make the optimal GPU selection and CPU selection so your workload runs uh, reasonably fast. Um, and then similarly, we want to make sure as you uh, can monitor all these things at a cluster-wide view, you can understand the health of your GPUs, their performance, is a, it's, an ex, it's an expensive resource. And then more broadly, what you might have seen in, in Jeremy's demo is like today, the way you select the GPU is a bit primitive. You just say, hey, I want one of them, or I want two of them. But many people, you know, you buy GPUs, Jeremy, you don't just throw away your old ones, right? No, right. no. So one of, the th one of the things we'd like to do is enrich the resource API uh, in Kubernetes generally so that rather than just say, I want one GPU, you want to be able to say, I want one GPU that has this many CUDA cores or this much memory. And so that's what we're calling our resource API v2, and that's a topic that's under active discussion. Okay. So uh, it's already 5.15. I forgot to leave time for questions. This slide just talks about some of the workloads that we run on our team in terms of... Uh, catching regressions, whether it's on bare metal, KVM, uh, public cloud, or in OpenShift at this point. There's a ton here. Uh, in fact, we ran a GPU benchmark, a financial services risk analytics benchmark that used eight voltas on Kubernetes last fall. Uh, if anyone's interested, find us at the demo booth later, or tomorrow. Uh, thank you all for attending.